Hello, everyone. Welcome to Reading the Room, a literary podcast featuring author interviews and discussions with bookish content creators. My name is Jalen, also known as The Bar in the Bookcase on YouTube. Today, I am joined by Ali Robottom, author of Aesthetica, published by Soho Press. Ali, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. So I devoured this book, and I was hoping to start the conversation. Can you give listeners a synopsis of what Aesthetica is all about? So Aesthetica is about a former Instagram influencer model uh, who's on the eve of a surgery. She's scheduled to undo all the past plastic surgery she's had done to her face. Um, And as she contemplates this dangerous surgery, she reflects on the beginning of her career when she was 19 and moved to Los Angeles with big hopes and dreams. Some success and some tragedy ensues. Going to the sort of dual timeline structure here, we follow her at 19 and in her 30s, as you mentioned, and I'm wondering, did that always start as the structure for this book? No. I have to sort of rack my memory to remember because I tried a lot of different structures and and even plots out with this book. It's my first novel and I barged into the process without a clear plan, which I won't be doing again. But no, I believe that in a previous iteration, it was told fairly linearly during only her younger uh, plot line trajectory. So only her 19 year old self. When I realized what this book was like truly about on a deeper level for me, I I understood that I needed that older perspective. No, it, it works so well. And I think having that dual timeline structure for me as a reader, it works so well to build suspense in both narratives because you know, you follow her like in the present moment and see what's kind of happened. And then her also trying to make this decision regarding aesthetic of the treatment, which makes me as a reader very nervous about what, what's going to happen and what that really in, uh, entails. And so I wanted to ask you about the idea of the aesthetic treatment itself and where that came in to the novel. You know, that was one of the last things that I added into the, the book. And it really represented, well, first of all, I, during the course of writing this book, I signed with a new agent and she was really encouraging when I was like, I have this crazy idea. I want to take the book in this even more weird and wild direction when it comes to the plastic surgery. And she was like, great, let's do it. And that kind of gave me the push to uh, add Aesthetica in, so thank you, Erin. But it was one of the last things that came and it developed over the course of doing a lot of research for the book in personal, my personal life doing research and then also just like reading about plastic surgery. And um, it was sort of a mashup of those two elements, the personal and the research-based reading that I was doing. But yeah, it came very, very late in the process. And I I think it sort of, to your point about building suspense and stuff, like I felt like I really needed one more thing to sort of take the book into that really suspenseful, really thick and like busy and hurried place that I think it's wound, wound up in. Yeah, I think this book has some really interesting like crossover appeal for like fans of horror or uh, more speculative fiction. I, I love that introduction here. And I think that's one of the joys of fiction generally is being able to add those interesting elements. And so I wanted to ask you about this being your debut novel and your previous work, Jello Girls, how that kind of felt for you writing in a fictional space. Um, it felt so good. <laughs> uh, Jello Girls, it wasn't hard to write necessarily, but it was a really emotional book to put out into the world and to get feedback on and just to sort of complete. And it definitely was, I know it's cliche to say, but it was the book that I had to write before I wrote other books. But my first love when I first started writing was fiction. So it felt really great to just be able to to come back to that and then open my hand a little bit and play and really just make stuff up and enjoy myself in that way when Jello Girls was sort of a um, a more emotional and in some ways grueling book to write and produce. Um, this book has just been so fun. But I think also like I was, one of the joys of fiction is that I was able to pour my personal experience and my like deep emotional connection to the material into this book and almost in a way that feels more authentic to myself than necessarily Jello Girl did. In terms of how it explores social media, I, you know, have read myself like a bunch of, you know, nonfiction of late. There was that really famous New Yorker piece, I think by Gia Tolentino about yeah. the Instagram face. And it was really interesting to see how you explore this from a fictional lens. And I hadn't really seen it done too much, um, despite there being so much discourse around it. And so I think this is really you know innovative on that front. But it also reminded me of one of my favorite 
subgenres of fiction, which is what I've dubbed like filling the void fiction, <laughs> a la like uh, Melissa Broder, for example. She's one of my yeah. favorite writers, and this really reminded me of that. And it's deep, like philosophical inquiry. There are so many revelatory insights here about it's so many things that it's hard to distill it all but essentially about autonomy and this idea of societal standards and how those play on selfhood that i really think you explore so well so i wanted to ask you about writing about that and incorporating your ideas about social media in this book i was thinking about how you explore like this idea of instagram face versus like evolution of like natural beauty being prioritized yeah. and like thinking about how you put like, those ideas into the narrative. That is actually an area where I really let my personal experience or just personal observation guide me. Um, I love the Gia Tolentino piece also. When it came out, I was like, oh my gosh, finally someone's writing about this. But I agree with you, like I hadn't seen it coming through fictionally and I was like, well, I'm gonna do that. And I feel like I'm uniquely positioned to be able to do that um, just because like, I've dabbled in plastic surgery myself. Like I've built an Instagram platform that I think sort of performs in some ways the content of this book. And I did that very purposefully so that I could write about it. But I think it really was born out of just sort of a lifelong experience coming up as a woman in this world and sort of negotiating and navigating all of these conflicting ideals and stand like conflicting standards of beauty and conflicting messages. and where Instagram is a relatively new and possibly somewhat dying at this point um, platform. Like it doesn't seem that different to me than, you know, Seventeen Magazine when I was a kid or any of the, the, the various platforms that we've cycled through culturally up until this point. So it's really easy to just take everything that I've experienced and all of that conflicting messaging and just project it onto Instagram where I see it being played out anyway. Yeah, it, it, I've been thinking about this a lot too, because, you know, myself, I, I've tried to like think about this book and apply it to like my niche, I guess, of being like on Bookstagram <laughs> and how that feels. It's like a different thing, of course, but I recently on my YouTube channel, I, I think it was like two or three months ago, I had a sort of like existential crisis about like what I'm doing. Like, why am I talking about books on the inter internet? Like, why can't I just read books in this room and just think about them and then move on? Like, why do I have to perform? And like gain followers or try to like have a successful podcast and what that means and I'm still those are huge questions that I'm still thinking about but I think this book really interestingly explores those things so I mean for you and you being a writer with an internet presence that's how I discovered you um how do you feel about being an author on Instagram right now and publishing a book about these topics like does it feel weird or I don't know it always feels so weird to, to publish and I guess I, I'm realizing recently that like it feels extra weird to publish a book, which I had learned with my first book and then like very conveniently forgotten. So now I'm like, oh yeah, this is, this is actually really strange. And, you know, all of my friends who are writers putting books out sort of echo that as well. I watch them one by one become these like anxious messes and I'm like, oh, that won't happen to me. And now here I am. So I think it's a fundamentally weird experience when it comes to social media and, and Instagram and my platform there I think like to me right now and especially with this book it feels like a really important element of my career and it I think that like writers very quickly become sort of sheepish when it comes to talking about self-promotion or putting yourself out there on Instagram and and there is a, it, it's a very personal decision to make whether or not you self-promote that way but for me it just feels like I want to get as many readers as I can. And I am always aware that I'm, my books are competing with people's phones, Instagram itself, Netflix, whatever, like everyone's busy. So I'm going to do what I can to package and sort of push my work out into the world. You know, if that means being on Instagram and, and promoting myself there, that's what I'm going to do. But I, you know, for me, it was like, well, then how can I like make something of this in my work? I like to see work that feels sort of like braided with an author's persona in a way that feels kind of lowbrow to say, but I think it's been going on for a really long time. Like if you look back at famous authors of yore, it's not like they weren't 
crafting a personal brand in some way or another. So I guess let's get into the book some more. Um, there are a couple dynamics that I want to ask you about. Okay. There's like three core dynamics. There's one with her mom, her sister, and then Jake, and then later yeah. Henry in the current yeah. timeline. So can you first talk about how you established the mother-daughter dynamic in this book? <laughs> that I think... You know, I sort of shied away from that for a while because my first book was so focused on mothers and daughters. But the fact of the matter is, is that when I started Aesthetica, I was still sort of deep in a personal period of grieving my own mom. So it kind of just came out from that place. And I think that embracing it was a really important part of writing the book. So like a lot of the mother-daughter dynamic in here was born of my own dynamic with my own mom who was sick for a lot of my life. And I think like one thing that didn't go into Jello Girls that came into this book was just the amount of resentment and frustration I would feel with my mom when she was sick. Um, and sort of like the fundamental challenge of caretaking a parent when you're still basically a child yourself. So that's where that came from. That was like a, mostly a personal sort of outpouring and I say this just because it's like relatively adjacent to this, but like the relationship that Anna has with her, like estranged friend slash like sister surrogate Leah was also a very personal feeling I had about losing touch with the women, primarily like two of my best friends from childhood that I felt like very separate from for a period of time. But you know, now in my adult life, I'm not separate from them, which is really nice. But yeah, that was all very sort of like a personal reckoning with a really like mother daughter relationships, but also like relationships between women and how they get interrupted and sort of disrupted by image culture and like our role therein as women. Yeah, I mean, going to her, her dynamic with her mother, there's something I was thinking about. I'm still sort of unpacking this, but there's like an interesting foil or contrast between you know the present moment of the elective procedure of aesthetica and also with her mom we learn about what happened with her and her experience being in the hospital with her and kind of thinking about this sort of i guess lack of a better word like force of being there and necessity of being there um given her mother's diagnosis and how you sort of use those two things as a sort of foil against each other i think was really effective aside from that there's also a couple of other social media influencers that she follows, which I thought were really interesting. It kind of goes to that theme of sort of the, the comparison or thinking about others around her and how that informed her own understanding of herself into adulthood. So could you talk about those um, other like side characters as well? Yeah, I really like them too. Um, it was fun to just sort of like infiltrate the book with fictionalized amalgams of people that I was following when I was working on it. But I think that like, there's this way that people like that become characters in our own lives, you know, like, at the time that I started Aesthetica, I was really into following a couple fitness influencers. And like, I would watch their vlogs and then follow them on Instagram. And they just sort of had no real relationship to me, but punctuated my life in such a way. And I would, you know, use them to zone out. So to me, it just feels very natural to have that sort of like recurring, almost like marker of time in the book that comes in the form of these like rando, somewhat rando influencers or, or figures that she follows. I mean, aside from that, I think one of the biggest you know, areas of conflict in this book is with the character of Jake and the, um, I guess, Me Too sort of other plot in this book that's going on. So can you talk about where that side of the plot came from and establishing Jake and all of that. Yeah, Jake was came like almost immediately when I started to draft this book. He just felt like a really obvious character. Like the scene where they first meet um, was one of the first things that I wrote, even though the plot changed quite a bit around it as I drafted and redrafted, like that remained. So I guess I knew it's in some way that like at the core of this story was like a problematic guy he so yeah he feels really like essential to the sort of unraveling of um what might otherwise be a triumphant story of coming to los angeles and making it big as an instagram model um but he's also i was really listening and really like engaged with the epstein stuff and weinstein and me too when it was happening which as a movement did really complicate my feelings about 
victimhood and and what was like good victimhood and I put that in quotation marks and what wasn't and why it was easier for me to empathize with certain women over others and that really made me take a look at at you know myself and where I was coming from um and then listening to the Ronan Farrow coverage of um Weinstein and, and deep diving on Epstein really made me want to like unpack these subtle elements of coercive control and, and manipulation on the page and like bake them into Jake's character in a way where he does seem very charming and and um, careful with Anna, the main character at times, but he's also significantly older at a time in both their lives where that age gap is really important and, and worth noting. And also he is ultimately profiting off of her in certain ways so yeah I just the whole thing like with him and the book in general is I just wanted to make everything feel really nuanced and gray instead of like he's bad or she's good or like whatever like I wanted to to really get into the the trickier bits of every character yeah I think one thing that I noticed with Jake is that he always asks how her mom is doing or (laughs) frequently asks and I was like that's interesting that she included that here and then I I kind of see why you did that because I think I think it's effective to kind of add some nuance to his character and and engrave that line because he does seem to care about her in certain respects but then I'll leave the reader to find out what happens (laughs) with that uh, dynamic yeah I guess I don't want to get into spoiler territory of course but I want to talk about Aesthetica, the procedure again, and I guess you don't have to say what happens with it, but how do you decide kind of what you wanted to happen with it or or not? Like, I feel like as a writer, I would, it would be a, a tough choice to like decide between whether you want it to go left or if it will succeed or how, yeah. how do you play with that idea of suspense with it? Ooh, I don't know. And you know, it's funny because like, ultimately I don't even really know how the surgery is gonna turn out you know Mm -hmm. like but I think overall for me with any of the cosmetic procedures that take place in the book like it felt very important to go through with them early readers of the book seemed to want me to take the character to sort of the precipice of any given surgery and then have her like turn away and do the like right thing by saying no. And that just felt so uh, unrealistic to me, you know, in a world and a culture where hundreds of thousands of women and gender non-conforming people are going through with surgeries, cosmetic or otherwise every day. It's like, why would she say no? when it came to deciding which direction to go with her choices to to go under the knife or not i sort of always erred towards going under um and then then seeing what happens from there rather than you know eschewing that call yeah what i think is really interesting and nuanced in this idea of aesthetica and how it sort of plays into this novel which i think is fascinating and so clever is like you know on, on the surface it is a procedure that is supposed to fix the problem of what she's done to her, yeah. supposedly, of, of all of these um, procedures on her. But it's still, in itself, another procedure. So I yeah. love that interesting question of like, okay, well, she's doing another, she's making another choice to do something that's elective. And what does that mean from like a moral versus aesthetic choice? And I there's one section in this book in which you explore the idea of moral versus aesthetic. And I recently read Elif Batuman's book, Either Or, which is all about this question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I just wanted to ask you about your ideas around that question of like the moral choices behind your characters versus like this idea of aesthetic and the gray line between those two ideals. It's a very broad question, but yeah, I mean, it's one I've struggled so much with personally and sort of on the page as well. It, like, it confuses me. I mean, obviously, we have a lot of conflicting societal voices that come in that like natural is better than unnatural but what even is natural versus unnatural you know I get very confused very quickly with that um I think that like I think that there's a way that really moralizing around personal choice when it comes to altering one's body becomes very quickly a way of imposing shame on individual people that to me is really a non-starter when it comes to like 
helping someone be happy and live their best life or like feel at home in their body in such a way. So I guess I just really wanted to explore the way in which those conflicting messages oftentimes do project shame onto, you know, any individual. And I, I do think it's different for like the Kardashians or whatever, it, but um, you know, when it comes to an individual person choosing to change their body in any way, it just feels like what, who cares? And why are we imposing, you know, some version of morality onto that when it's just, honestly, it just boils down to personal choice a lot of the time. Yeah, totally. I mean, these are questions that I myself am constantly thinking about. Like, I remember I purchased Facetune like a long time ago, and I remember I was always saying like that was the best four dollars I ever spent. Like, love it. <laughs> like on Zoom, I have like a light blur in my face. Like these things are kind of just naturally part of like I don't know being online now and like thinking or applying like a morality principle or like some sort of like test onto what that means. I don't know. It, it's really tough. And something that I think about frequently being, you know, online as all of us do, I just think from a fictional perspective and like kind of novelizing those questions, this is, I can't think of a better way to do it than how you sort of compile all of this, especially with Aesthetica, like a plot perspective, so unputdownable. So all that to say, I want to commend you on how you put all those questions in here. Because for me, I, I don't know how you did it. <laughs> well, you're explaining it now, but I, I it just seems like a huge task, so. Oh, thank you, that's so nice. I had a lot of difficulty like um, like selling people on the idea of it in the book industry. So that's just really nice to hear. You know, it's been so nice to see that people are relating to it because I started the book being like, I think that this is a really relevant topic to readers and thinkers today. And um, it's just nice to see that seeming to be true. It certainly is a really relevant topic for me. Are you familiar with um, the trauma plot essay that's been kind of going around thinking about like the sort of um, making a character's like entire identity like about their trauma or yeah. what have you and I think I just wanted to mention that because I keep talking about it on my channel <laughs> and on with like other authors and other authors have mentioned it to me like when I haven't brought it up and I just think it's a really interesting piece but all that to say I think your book really sort of subverts the critique of that because I think the way that you use the dual narrative to sort of explore what's going on in the past along with the present really kind of like gets around that. So I just wanted to know if you had like thought about that and those sort of ideas of trauma plots generally in crafting the book. That's a good question. I mean, I, I think I was so focused on just <laughs> making the book really propulsive and, and exploring the issues that I wanted to explore however I had to do that that I wasn't and I was writing this before that piece came out um and I remember seeing it being like hmm that's interesting I think I also recently this sort of a sidebar but saw a piece of writing and it might have included one of the books that I just referenced bad thoughts the story collection about sort of in support of bringing back trauma plots. So that felt really like funny to me, just that criticism of books seems to sort of toggle between, you know, someone will come out with an idea and then someone else will be like, well, let me write a piece that's subverting that. So anyway, um, I didn't think that much about it. I was just kind of in the creative space being like, how do I make this book super readable? And how do I convey emotionally the, the real like, toil and um, challenge of this character's journey through her life up to this point. I think it's completely successful on that front. So I commend you again for, <laughs> for doing that. It reads very you know, easily and it's very propulsive, but it really challenged me and my ideas about what we're doing on the internet. And those are some of my favorite books. So thank you for writing it. For <laughs> reading it. <laughs> Even going to like the book cover, I, I haven't really asked what book covers on this podcast, but I want to ask you about this one because I think I saw this first on NetGalley, I think, and I it instantly caught my eye. It's clearly inspired by Instagram stories, and I love the sort of distortion playing on it. Um, yeah. Did you have any involvement with the cover, or how did this come to be? Yeah, I had some involvement. The cover designer's name is Jaya Nicely. This was like kind of similar to the first idea that she had for the, the book cover. We just tweaked the color. I wanted a, a book that didn't feel 
like I liked a red palette. It felt really selling and also like less sort of quote unquote feminized than um, a lot of books that I see out there. And like, I didn't want my book to fall into like an easy category necessarily. So I thought she nailed it. We really just tweaked the, the color and some of the font and made sure that this is so silly, but like another writer, Coco Mellers, I was talking to her at a reading one night and she was like, you want to make sure that the, I was like showing her a, um, a mock-up for the cover. And she was like, you want to make sure that the figure's eyes are making contact with whoever's going to pick the book up. Eye contact sells more copies. So thank you, Coco, for that. But yeah. <laughs> That's so interesting. And that is some tea because I purchased Cleopatra and Frankenstein based on the, the cover. I saw it and I was like, that is stunning. And so it worked on me <laughs> as well. <laughs> um, but yeah, I can't even like, I'm so excited to see this in bookstores too, because it just, it looks stunning. I think it's going to catch many readers' eyes. So I wanted to ask you about what you're reading and um, what influences you're reading and anything you want to talk about that. Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, I just finished reading for the second time um, one of my close friends' novels. Her name is Taya Hasik Blachowicz and um, her debut novel, or it's actually her second novel. Her debut novel was Life of the Party. And this book is called A Cigarette Lit Backwards. And it was super fun. Like it's a really funny, but sort of deep and emotional coming of age story set in North Carolina in the punk scene of the early 2000s. So I really recommend that book. I really liked it and uh, read it twice. <laughs> I've also been reading Angels by Dennis Johnson and i'm racking my mind because i read a lot of books that aren't published yet um reading for my writing group which is a real joy of mine i also recently reread bad thoughts by my friend nada alec that's a story collection right that's a story collection um a really great one and i've been reading a lot of story collections actually recently heartbreak by chelsea beaker is another one that i loved this past year maybe one of my favorite reads of the year which as you know means violence uh, it's a sort of a collection of critical theory but really easy to read by a writer called philippa snow um i really loved that book recently as well um it kind of it includes like jackass and maria abramovich and and really goes into sort of self-inflicted harm as performance art and it sounds like super heady, but it's really easy to read, but also very smart. So I really recommend that one as well. I love it. Okay, that sounds so good because I remember um, my experience with Marina Abramovich. I was following like Lady Gaga when she was um, releasing Art Pop and she had uh -huh. some like collabs with her. So I've been wanting to like read more about her and her work. She seems like a really fascinating person. So I'll have to check yeah. it out. I highly recommend that book for that. I'll leave a link below to purchase this. And um, if you read it, please let me know what you think. And thank you, Ali, so much for talking to me about all this. Um, it was a lovely conversation. So thank you. Oh, thank you for having me. Such a joy. Bye, everyone. Bye.